Hi, this is Gail Sokol, and on today's show, we're going to be baking with kids. Welcome to Baking Radio. Learn the art and science of baking with author, educator, and award-winning chef, Gail Sokol. Whether you've been baking your whole life, or you're brand new to the world of baking and you're looking to build your confidence and learn new skills in the kitchen, you're in the right place. This is Baking Radio. So baking with kids, that is, some people love to do it, and some people don't like baking with kids. Well, I'm a mom, but I've also been teaching kids professionally for over 18 years. I actually run a baking program, and I used to teach cooking as well, to kids anywhere from 9 to 18, and I love it. Kids are fabulous. Um, they love being in the kitchen and I'll, I'll explain exactly what happens when they are in the kitchen, because a lot of things can, can happen that are really cool. Number one, being in the kitchen with your kids creates quality time. Whatever you're doing with your child, I mean, it could be just setting the table, but if they are picking through the green beans or they are mixing spices for an apple pie and they're not old enough to do something you know, uh, like chopping or, or cutting something up, it can be a great way to spend some quality time with them. We are all so busy in this crazy world that we're always looking for some time to sort of, you know, spend with our kids and, and get them to sort of tell us what they did during their day or what's troubling them or, you know, if they had a fight with their best friend. And sometimes when you're doing stuff in the kitchen, like baking, things come out. Um, You may be rolling out a dough, you may be mixing things, and all of a sudden your child may say, you know, mom, so-and-so said this to me and it upset me and I want to talk about it. And you're like, really? And you can have this great conversation. So I really have some wonderful memories with my own children as they were growing up, creating treats. Uh, that we made together and then we, we shared. So some of the best conversations you can have with your children have been congregating and doing something fun in the kitchen. So people tend to be a little calmer when they're in the kitchen. So you're probably coming home from work or maybe you don't work or maybe you work part-time and you want to sort of plan ahead of what you can do. But whatever you make, Whatever you do, make sure it's age appropriate for your child. And we'll go into that a little bit later. But what I find, I love to have some incidental learning happening. And this is learning that you're not going to say, you know, Johnny, you know, you know that two plus two is four and we're going to put two cups of this and two cups of that. That's, that's sort of like hitting the kid over the head with the learning experience. Incidental learning is, You're measuring an ingredient and you need three teaspoons of something. And it's like, oh, by the way, I could use my tablespoon as well. Three teaspoons is a tablespoon. Or one cup is eight fluid ounces. You know, hey, hey, mom, I just learned that in science class. And that is incidental learning, something where it just sort of happens, just happens per chance. So when I teach children, I really go into the proper way to measure things proper measuring skills for liquids, solids, weight measurement, proper knife skills when it's appropriate. Remember, the child has to be of the appropriate age. The importance of sanitation. How do we not get sick uh, with foodborne illness? How do we know um, if a food is clean enough to eat and we wash our hands before and after we touch uh, ingredients? Um, Things like how chemical leaveners work. How does baking powder and baking soda work? And what ingredients do they react with? We've had previous shows where we've discussed chemical leaveners and baking soda, for instance, needs an acid. It needs an acidic ingredient uh, to react to form carbon dioxide gas bubbles that help to leaven the baked good. That's a cool thing to discuss with your kids. Even yeast and fermentation. If you're making a pizza dough, that's a cool thing to discuss with kids. Osmosis, when water goes from a higher concentration of itself to a lower concentration of itself through a, you know, semi-permeable membrane, that's sort of a cool thing. 
Kids will hear about this in science class, I promise you. And maybe you will beat the teacher to it. And you'll show them this incidental learning and these incidental learning experiences with you in the kitchen. By the time they get to science class, it's like, yeah, I already know this. This is sort of cool. Um, and they'll understand it that much better. What about gluten? What is gluten? Uh, maybe they have a friend that has celiac and maybe they now will understand the importance of gluten and why their friend has to have something special to eat. And we've even had a gluten-free show. And its importance um, in baked goods uh, and how gluten actually can help baked goods to rise. Because gluten is that protein matrix that is formed from the proteins in wheat flour when they're mixed with water. And if we don't have them, the baked good doesn't rise because carbon dioxide gets stuck in that protein matrix. And if we don't have carbon dioxide get stuck in there, we have a heavy, very dense baked good that doesn't taste very good. So a lot of students will actually see or hear about what we're discussing in science class again. And I love to reemphasize what they've learned. It's wonderful. So the knowledge that this kitchen science gives young, a young chef, and I, I like to call them young chefs, um, is especially important when baking properly because baking, there's a real science to it. Um, and these measurement skills and being sort of just so and just exact really is more important in baking than it really is in cooking. So how do you know when your child is capable what do you know what, you know what they're capable of doing in the kitchen? How do you, how do you know? Um, the age of the child and their ability to listen and follow directions will determine to what extent they can help you in the kitchen. So even when my child was too young to help me, and I would say, you know, maybe age three, uh, she was very interested in helping me. I would place her safely on the countertop next to me. I uh, give her a small task to do. Maybe she was mixing up some spices for me or helping me measure with me really watching over her um, or placing muffin liners into a muffin pan. Uh, super easy to do. And talking to her about what I'm doing. That actually reinforces, uh, you know, the, the what you're making with your child and it actually can help them retain this information. So. Your child's attention span will increase with maturity and age, and it depends. Boys and girls are very, very different. So I've accepted kids into my baking program as young as nine. I usually say 10, but I'll tell you, I've had some pretty amazing nine-year-olds. And sometimes the best bakers are the youngest ones. They're very motivated. They know what they want. Uh, they like good food. They want to know what's in their food, and they want to create it themselves. And they've been encouraged by their parents. So those parents that have allowed their child to read, follow directions from the recipe, and be in the kitchen with some guidance from them really go far. And I'm not saying they're going to grow up to become an iron chef. That's not the point. The point is they will grow up to have skills in which are, they are self-sufficient in the kitchen. They know what type of foods are good for them. They know what's in their food and they know how to make it. So look to your child for guidance. Let them tell you when they're ready to help in the kitchen. Now, if your child says, mom, I don't want to, I don't want to help you. I don't want to do it. Never force them. That's just not their thing. And maybe it's just not the right time. So never force your child to help you in the kitchen. It's a good way of turning them off uh, forever. Don't, don't do it. And maybe they'll, There'll be a time when your child will run into the kitchen and say, hey, mom, that smells delicious. What is it? Can I help? And you'll probably go, oh, my goodness, of course. So you'll be very surprised, but it may happen. So when my daughter turned five, I was making homemade pizza dough. And I gave her a small portion of the dough to form her own little individual pizza. And I remember this like it was yesterday. She loved shaping the dough. So I put her at the table. Um, I gave her some flour. Uh, I, you know, I told her to push it out and we could put the sauce and the cheese on it. Well, after about an hour of sh just shaping the dough, forget the sauce and the cheese, 
she was having so much fun. She was shaping and reshaping and then almost like it was clay. Unfortunately, pizza dough is not like clay and the gluten got very, very tough and it almost was like a rubber band. So she couldn't do much with it. So I taught her, you know, give it a rest, leave it alone for a little while um, and then come back to it. And then after a while, she basically destroyed that little blob of pizza dough because the gluten just sort of disintegrated and broke down. But she had such great stamina and she wanted to stick with that little piece of pizza until I sort of ordered her to, I said, you know, you got to put the sauce on. This is it. We got to do it. And we can't wait any longer. And then the cheese and she ate her pizza and she was so proud of it. They're really, really, um, they take pride. Kids take pride in what they're doing. And you know what? It's true. They will tend to eat it if they have made it. That is so, so true. So fine motor skills, you know, when you're really concentrating and your child has these little tiny, you know, ways to hold things very, very carefully, they will develop them at different times. Gross motor skills are on the playground. They're running around. They're going down the sliding board. Those are gross motor skills. Fine motor skills, holding a fork and spoon, holding a knife, cutting their food, maybe even helping you chop. Those are fine motor skills and they will develop at different times. Again, don't push it. I never allow a child to chop foods with a knife until I see them developing these fine motor skills. And I watch over each child and I give classes up to 14 or 16 students and I am watching them like a hawk. So um, when they're ready, the easiest food to chop, in my opinion, is something like nuts. So you get little, uh, you know, pieces of maybe walnut halves or pecan halves, and you can chop that. And let me explain how. So you want the dominant hand to hold the handle of the knife and the other hand to go on top of the knife. So the, obviously the non-sharp uh, edge so that the child can chop the knife like a seesaw. So you want to almost make like a seesaw motion. And this should be done on a stabilized cutting board. And by that, I mean, and most of you may know what I mean. You take a cutting board, whatever one you want to use, and I stabilize it. If it doesn't work well on your work surface, no matter what surface that is, you can take a kitchen towel, put a little water on it. Don't make it sopping wet. Just put a little water on it and then lay it down, fold it, lay it down, and then put your, um, your cutting board on top of it and it should not slide around. Try it. If it doesn't slide around, it's stabilized. And if the kitchen towel doesn't do it, you can even use paper towels that have been slightly wet. And you don't want it to slide around. So when the child is chopping, they know that they don't want that sliding around. If anything is sliding, stop immediately and, and try to stabilize it. So remember, slow chopping is the best way. Even when I was in culinary school, uh, years ago, you cannot become an iron chef overnight. You cannot become an iron chef in a few minutes. And a lot of kids want to be, uh, cutting food should be done slowly. And if you do them in slow motion, you'll see the speed will come over time, but start slow. So the next point I want to, I want to bring up is teaching your child science, the science of baking and explaining why certain ingredients react with one another to get that final baked good. It's a cool thing to do, but you don't want to sound like you're proselytizing. You don't want to sound, you know, too, um, too much teacher-like or they will be turned off. So again, make that incidental learning, make it fun. Teach them that baking powder, did you know it reacts twice to form carbon dioxide gas bubbles um, that are going to get stuck in that gluten matrix in the dough or the batter? And it needs moist ingredients as well. And then another batch of carbon dioxide is going to form in the oven when it encounters heat. So that's double acting baking powder. Keep teaching your child and eventually they're going to say that lesson back to you. Trust me, I've had kids and I only have them for a week uh, at a time and they will teach me back. They will tell me what gluten is by the end of the week. They know what it is. They know what carbon dioxide is um, in relationship to um, how it's formed with baking powder and baking soda. They're very smart. 
and they understand things. They're like sponges. So the science of baking is going to rub off and they're going to understand the basics because they've been exposed to it in a fun and a very practical way. And my best advice, don't dummy down to your kids. Boy, can they tell when you're dumbing down to them. I've made Danish pastry with nine-year-olds, croissant with uh, nine-year-olds. I don't dummy down to them. Uh, If you teach them about what you're making in the kitchen without talking down to them or using baby words, they're going to actually understand it that much better. They're never too young to hear uh, a lesson in the kitchen, baking science, how to weigh properly, how to measure properly. So go, go into the kitchen right now, go into the kitchen, be with your kids, make some muffins, make a cookie, um, make a pizza dough and see how much fun you both have. Not to mention what incredible memories you'll be creating because my kids still bring up to me, hey mom, remember when we made this? Remember how much fun we had? It really works. It really is, is fabulous. So if you've enjoyed the episode today, Hit the subscribe button. And if you'd like to leave me a review, I would greatly appreciate it. If you haven't picked up my most recent book, Baking with Success, it's available on Amazon and in bookshops worldwide. So if you have any questions, head on over to bakingradio.com and leave me a message. I would love to answer some of your questions on air. Maybe you have started uh, baking with your kids and you have a question. I would love to hear from you. And on the next show, we're going to be discussing. 12 Steps to Yeast Bread, a series, part one.